Well, this morning, we're going to return to the series that we started last week. The Next Level is what our series is called. Uh, in this, we're going to be taking a look, or we started last week taking a look at three areas, three very important areas, crucial areas in the Christian walk that to some degree or another, there's great disparity between what the Bible teaches about these areas and what is actually going on, what's actually playing out in the life of Christians, what's actually playing out in the life of the church. Now, last week, we looked at the area of personal evangelism, making missions personal. And unfortunately, through the message, we concluded that the overwhelming of majority, or the overwhelming majority of Christians are not actively engaged in the proper biblical process of sharing their faith, despite the fact that if it was only in the Bible one place, which is there more than that, plus the life of Jesus, we are told to do this in the Great Commission. Remember we said 5%, 5%, only 5% of Christians in the United States of America have ever led someone else to the Lord. Well, this week... We're going to take another look at another area, number two. And actually, it's going to be this week and next. I didn't realize this until God made it clear on Friday that we needed to kind of hang here for two weeks. And so that's what we're going to do. Uh, this is a very important area also where the research shows where the stats are weak at best and sad at worst. And this morning, we're going to be looking through, as always, not my lens, but the lens of Scripture at the subject of obedient, generous, joyful giving. You say, is there another kind of giving? Well, yes. Look at number one, there's no giving. And then you can look at the antonym of each one of these words, right? Begrudging, not happy, right? So we're going to be looking at obedient, which does mean there's a command there, generous, Joyful giving. That's what we're going to be looking at. Our message is entitled, Beating the Averages. Beating the Averages. This week is obviously week number one. And uh, so we're going to be looking here. Now, Beating the Averages is a very appropriate title. Why? Well, because research tells us that despite the enormous amount of teaching in the Bible about giving... Though there's specific teachings by Jesus Christ himself. You want to know what the average Christian gives to the causes of Christ? You want to know what the average Christian gives to the furthering of God's kingdom in the United States of America? 2.8% of their income. 2.8% of their income. Now, I need to make sure you understand something here today. We don't do this a whole lot, but this morning we are talking about money, dollars. Yes, you're supposed to give your time. Yes, you're supposed to give your talent. Yes, you're supposed to give your life. But we're not talking about that. I want to be very specific with you this morning. We are talking about giving in regards to finances, in regards to money. Now, to tell you the truth, most, pa most pastors don't like preaching on giving. You want to know why? Well, because normally it has to do with the crowd receiving. You see, in most cases, people don't mind when you teach about money, as long as you're sticking to maybe areas of like avoiding debt or saving, something that will personally improve their position. But when it comes to giving, actual giving, not so much. I'm not saying that's the crowd here. I'm just saying in general. So before we go any further in love, please know this. I have sought God's will all week on this. First, it was just, no, 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 I don't want to preach on this. And he said, yes, 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 you're going to. And I stopped saying, no, 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 after that. But I began praying, Lord, please, give me the heart. I, I'm preaching this from as your pastor, a heart that loves you. And so please know that. If you're not a Christian, hear me. Do what you want with your money. If you've never said yes to Jesus Christ, if you've never grabbed a hold of his gift of grace... By faith, putting your total trust for your life here, 
the redemption of your relationship with God, the forgiveness of your sins, and your home one day in eternity with, in, with God in heaven. Listen to me. If you've never done that, if you are unsaved, if you are lost, can I get any more specific? But I'm trying to make sure you understand. If this is you, spend your money on whatever you want. In fact, eat, drink, and be merry. And the reason I say that is because you better enjoy it now. Because number one, you can't take it with you. And number two, the place that you're going, if you had all the money in the world available to you down there in that place that the Bible calls hell, you cannot buy your way out of there. And so all of that to say this, if this morning you don't know Jesus as your Lord and Savior, Accept the greatest gift ever given. Say yes to him. Now listen to me. For those of you, for those of you who are saved, you have said yes to Jesus. And according to the biblical standard, which we're going to go over not till next week, according to the biblical standard and its commands, you are right now, to the best of your knowledge, striving to be an obedient, generous, joyful giver. Praise God and thank God for you. And here's what I would challenge you to do with today's message. Let it encourage you to keep on keeping on. Let it encourage you to always going to the next level with your giving. Let me encourage you to use today's message from God's word as more um, um, stuff to go into your quiver of knowing him better and then being able to go out and have a legitimate, peaceful a caring discussion with people when it comes to giving to the work of God. Use it. If that describes you, don't sit and think, well, I've, you know, I've got the next 30 minutes or so just to kind of plan the rest of my day. God's got something in here for you also. But now I'm to my last group, and I have no idea whether that group was represented in here or not. That's not my job to know that. It's my job to equip you. You ready? If you're here today... And you are a Christ follower. If you're here today and you have said yes to Jesus Christ. And you don't like it when a pastor, including me, speaks regarding what the Bible has to say about giving. Then there really is only one simple reason. And that's probably because you're not adhering to what the Bible says about giving. It's not hard to figure that out. It's just a truth that we have to face. You see, if you're not giving financially, to the cause of Christ, according to the standard in the Bible. And I'm not just talking about an amount. I'm talking about an attitude. I'm talking about obedience. If you're not doing that, then I have to tell you something. Christ is not first place in your life. He's not. And so when Christ is not a first place in your life and something else is, it's called an idol. And money, unfortunately, can be an idol itself or it can be a vehicle To an idol. And when that's the case in the life of a Christian. And somebody begins to point that out from God's word. Hear me. From God's word. In love. It doesn't matter. It still bothers us. Why? Well because you know that you're wrong. And yet somebody is messing with those idols. If your idol is security. Then money is a tool that our culture says can take care of that. If your idol is being accepted. Then money can help you and your family achieve that goal. Oftentimes money's not an idol, but it's used as that vehicle to an idol. Whether the idol is success, whether the idol is possessions, whatever it is, money can become an issue. And really, it's not money itself, it's not possessions itself, because believe me, there's nothing inherently wrong with money at all. The problem is the heart. It's not about money or possessions. It's when money and possessions possess you. And God knows that it's a big deal. God knows that it can become a problem. You want to know how I know that? Why do you think that over half of the parables that Jesus spoke about deal with money and possessions? Why do you think that one-fourth, that's 25% of every single thing that Jesus taught in the Gospels was about money and And or possession. You want to know why? Because God in his sovereignty knew, knew what a struggle money and positions would be and can be. And what an effect, both negative and at times positive, they can have on the life of his children. That's why. 
he taught about it so much. Now, let me tell you something also. Can I please? If you have a desire to be rich, let me be the first to congratulate you. Because if you live in the United States of America, which I'm assuming all of you do, then you are rich. You are astronomically wealthy. Now, maybe not in comparison to someone you see in a magazine here in the States, or maybe not in comparison to a neighbor three or four or five houses down, or whatever that is, but listen to me, globally, in a global perspective, if you live in the United States of America, you are filthy rich in comparison with the rest of the world. Do you know that outside of the United States, the average person lives on 2 to $3 a day? A day. We spend more than that on a cup of coffee at Starbucks, which is coming to Parkersburg. We do. And so we are wealthy. But are we handling it well? Well, this morning I want to challenge us. I want to challenge us as God has challenged me. Now listen to me, you need to know this. I have no right to stand up here and preach about giving obediently, generously, uh, no right, joyfully, no right if I'm not doing it. And so I want you to know as your pastor, before I go any further, I wouldn't stand up here and preach on this if I wasn't modeling it. You want to check? Go talk to the finance team. I'm not saying that to brag at all. I'm saying that to let you know that I have no right to stand up here and talk to you about it if I'm not doing it. I'm not doing it. And I am. I am. So hear me. I want to challenge you. Why? Because 2.8% is pathetic. It's a pathetic stat as it relates to us, his children, and what we're giving back to our Savior who gave all for us. 2.8%, the average that Christians give to the cause of Christ who gave 100% of his life. Who owns it anyway? It's all his. He doesn't need our money. He wants our obedience. He wants our love. He wants our gratitude. I'm not here this morning to shame you. I'm not here this morning to make you feel guilty. I'm actually here as a a coach, a pastor, right? I want to call you out to the very best, whether it deals with personal evangelism, and I'm naming some of the things I've preached on in the past, whether it deals with uh, handling conflict, whether it deals with parenting, whether it deals with how to uh, use scripture in your life. All these areas, my goal as your pastor and my duty is to, from God's word, equip you to do your best. Why? Because God doesn't want us to settle for average. God doesn't want us to settle for marginal. God doesn't want good. God wants great. But unfortunately, in the area of giving, a lot of Christians are settling for way Less than that. Now, one more disclaimer. Before I go any further, please know that this message is not driven by an agenda. Uh, This message is not reactionary to anything that has happened other than the leading of the Lord. I am very proud of this church. I am very proud and very thankful to be the pastor, listen to me, of a very, very giving church a church that over just the last four years has given 1.8 million dollars to the cause of christ to furthering the kingdom of god through the ministries of this local body and more than that 20 percent of that 1.8 million dollars over 373 thousand dollars has gone directly to furthering the kingdom on the mission field by missionaries, both foreign and domestic. And for that I say, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord and thank you very much for your willingness and for your generosity. Now, some may be sitting here thinking, okay, pastor, if that's the case. And you are very, very proud, very, very thankful for this very, very giving church. 
Why do you feel it's necessary to challenge us? Why do you feel it's necessary to preach in the area of giving? Now, that's a very good question. And I have two, what I feel are very adequate, very good answers. Number one, when it comes to this pulpit, it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to God. When it comes to my sermons, I don't preach what I want to preach. I preach what God wants me to preach. And one day I'm going to stand before Him and I'm going to give an account for that. And so when He made me aware that this is what I was supposed to speak about today and next week, you want to know what it became? The number one necessity. But that's not it. That's not the only reason. You want to know the other reason why I'm preaching this to y'all, though this is a very, very giving church as a whole? Truth is, just because a local body of believers as a whole is obediently giving generously does not mean that every person, every member, every Christian who is a part of that whole is participating in that obedient, joyful generosity. And you're missing out. Let me illustrate what I just said. I read of a church. I'm aware of a church. I know this church whose financial records revealed that 57% of its offerings were being given by 20% of its members. And 20% of its members were not giving anything at all ever. And somewhere in between, there was a percentage of folks that were averaging about $10 a week. What am I trying to say? I'm giving you an example of a church that although when you look at the whole picture, they are giving very, very, very generously to the work of Christ. When you look at the individual parts of that whole, many, 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 many are missing out. Many, 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 many are not participating. Many, 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 many need to take giving to the next level for the glory of God and the furtherance of His kingdom. So I have two questions for you this morning. That church that I just talked about it is a real church, a church that I know very well. Not this church. But my question is, does that describe this church? More importantly, does that describe you? Take your Bibles and turn to Proverbs chapter 11. Proverbs chapter 11, Proverbs, the majority of them were written by King Solomon, the son of David. As testified by God, Solomon was the wisest person to have ever lived, given his wisdom by God. Solomon writes a great deal about money. Solomon writes a great deal in the book of Proverbs about generosity. Proverbs chapter 11, in a moment I'm going to be reading verses 24 to 28. Proverbs chapter 11, 24 to 28. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly but comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. People curse the one who hoards grain, but they pray God's blessing on the one who is willing to sell. Whoever seeks good finds favor, but evil comes to one who searches for it. Those who trust in their riches will fall, but the righteous will thrive like a green Leaf. Now, this is a great foundational passage because it addresses what happens to a generous person as well as addressing hoarding, which is the exact opposite of generosity. Listen to what the Bible says about the fate of a person who cho chooses hoarding over generosity. Verse 24 says that withholding what should be given is not right. Verse 26 says that those who withhold instead of being generous are held in low regard by fellow peep, by fellow man. Verse 28 says that some, someone withholding instead of giving as a means of security will fall. Hear me when I say this. 
in this passage, as well as nowhere in the Bible, is a positive word, a single positive word given related to those who choose to withhold instead of giving generously, obediently, and joyfully. All through the Bible. Now contrast this with the promise for the generous person. Verse 25 says that a generous man will prosper. A generous man will prosper. He who refreshes others will himself be refreshed. Verse 26 says that even selling something is better than withholding it as a means of security. Verse 28 says that those who choose righteously in the area of generosity will flourish like a green leaf. Will flourish like a a piece of foliage. Now, Proverbs clearly teaches as well as the rest of Scripture, that God wants His people to be generous. He wants us to be generous. Why do you think He wants us to be generous? What do you think the main reason He wants us to be generous is? What? Obedient, yes. But what's the best way to get somebody to do something? If I want my kids to be obedient, if I want my kids to read the Bible, if I want my kids to be respectful, who do they need to look at and see? Who? It's not caught, it's taught. I mean, it's not taught, it's caught. That's right. And you want to know why God wants us to be generous? Because he's generous. And if there was only one verse in the Bible to prove his generosity, it's this. For God so loved the world that he... His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God is the supreme example of generosity. But while I'm there, and I look out and see teenagers, I look out and see some younger people, moms and dads, you want to know how your children are going to give financially to the Lord's work? According to your standard. We're teaching on Sunday nights the effect of parenting in a defective world. And for those of, that are in here that are in that class, you remember what Chip said about that imaginary conversation that he had with his children on the couch, looking at them saying, hey, I want you to treat people just like you see me treating people. I want you to forgive like you see me forgiving. I, I want you to study God's word like you see me studying God's word. I want you to give financially to God's work like you see me doing it. Can I tell you something? In the United States of America, if that's what we're saying, then the average child is going to grow up to give 2.8% of their income to the work of the Lord. God was an example to us. We must be an example to our children. And what does that example look like? Well, can I tell you what it doesn't look like? It doesn't look like the world Would anybody disagree with me that according to God's standard, we're supposed to be different than the world? Anybody disagree? How many agree? Are we supposed to be different than the world? Absolutely. And guess what? That's included in our giving. Uh, The pastor and author Tim Kelly said that one of the areas that this must happen in is generosity. Compared to the world, we should have radical generosity. Listen to what he says. Uh, The early church, he says, radical generosity began all the way back at the beginning of the church. The early church was strikingly different from the culture around it in this way. The pagan society, or the world, was stingy with its money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan, someone from the world back then, gave nobody their money and gave practically everybody their body. The Christians, they came along and they were radical They gave practically nobody their body outside of their spouse. And they gave practically everybody their money. Did you hear me? They gave practically everybody their money. They practiced radical generosity. Well, as we look at Solomon's wise counsel, it's going to help us to answer some basic questions about the nature of generosity and giving. The Proverbs is a general book of wisdom. Now, just because it's in the Old Testament, don't discount it. Proverbs is a book of general wisdom, which means could the Israelites use it? Yes. But was it specific just for them? The answer is no. No. And so I'm just going to uh, build, right? I'm going to build on these verses as we look at three simple questions. 
Last week, I gave you some information in Matthew chapter 4, some principles for sharing your faith modeled by Jesus Christ. Uh, this week, we're going to line up everything under three basic questions. I should, again, say this week and next week. This week, we're actually only going to cover question number one. We're going to look at radical generosity. What scripture has to say relating to it. We're going to look at three questions. Who should we give to? Who should we give to? Why should we give? And ah, the one you're probably waiting on. How much should we give? Who should we give to? Why should we give? And how much should we give? This morning we're only going to look at one. Who should we give? give to who should we give to number one we should give to our children now that's probably not the first thing you were expecting to come out of my mouth probably what you were thinking is that I was going to talk this entire time about giving to the church and though that's a part of it in fact as we get there you'll see it is the primary vehicle that God wants to use. There are other people that we should be showing our radical generosity to. There are other people that we should be giving to. And the first one is our children. Our own children should be on the receiving end of our, generation, of our generosity. But there's a limit. Let's talk about it. Proverbs 13, 22 says this. A good man leaves an inheritance for his children's children. Children's children we're supposed to give to our children now let me give the first disclaimer no doubt we have all seen movies about or read stories about or maybe you know someone actually in real life whom they gave all this big inheritance of money a big chunk of money to kids who weren't ready for it and what did they do waste it spend it misuse it never really mature in the area of learning how to work for something and that's not good anybody want to say amen it's not good unfortunately we live in a generation uh, the millennials and the kids that are even below me we live in a generation where that's all they expect to, to be given life I, I hate to say this lazy unwilling to work wants it given to them entitlement is what we like to call it and you want to know whose fault that is not the kids it's the parents. Why do you think Solomon said this in Proverbs 20, 21? An inheritance quickly gained at the beginning will not be blessed at the end. He's, dumping, he's talking about dumping that huge amount of money right up front to your kids. Anybody ever heard of Larry Burkett? Some of you older folks may have. Larry Burkett used to be the, uh, um, oh, who is it now? Just draw a mental blank. The financial guy now. Ramsey, David Ramsey. Larry Burkett used to be that guy, right? Larry Burkett founded Crown Financial Ministries, and they were the initial pioneers, at least in the church, in the Christian world, at making biblical teaching on money plain and then getting it out there uh, to the church in regards to financial stewardship. And here's what Larry Burkett said about this subject matter in regards to giving to children. He said, there are many ways to ruin your children's life. But the fastest way to, is to give them more money than they need when you die. A Christian parent should give to their children, yes, yes, to pass on a legacy. Yes, to pass on some assistance. Yes, to even pass on a, a tangible form of your love for them. But listen, their children should not be their primary goal. Even as they give properly to their children, you want to know what your goal should be as you die? The same as your goal should be financially as you were living. To advance the kingdom of God. To advance the cause of Christ. And he lived it out. In fact, he did just that. Gave more money away to furthering the kingdom than he did even to his own family. Now hear me, that doesn't mean we don't take care of our family. I'm not trying to say that it's wrong uh, for a, a young parent who's got kids. I, I myself have five kids and a wife. I have life insurance, right? If something were to happen to me today, that, that is there to help them in their life because I'm not here anymore unexpectedly. He's talking about more of at the end of life when you've seen your children move on and, and hopefully you've seen them uh, 
work and, and gain things the way we should gain it. So please, please don't think that I, I'm saying that if you have life insurance, you're wrong. If you have life insurance, you've got it set aside for your kids to help them in God. That's not what I'm saying, okay? It's not what Larry's saying. We need to be giving to our kids, but we need to be doing it according to the standard of the Bible. Number two, who do we give to? We give to those in need. We give to those with needs. We give generously, obediently, joyfully, generously to those who are, hear me, truly in need. Proverbs 14, 21, blessed is he who is kind to the needy. Blessed is he who is kind to the needy. Proverbs 14, 31, he who oppresses the poor shows contempt for their maker. But whoever is kind to the needy honors God. Are we supposed to be living a life glorifying and honoring to God? Yes or no? Then this verse says, He who oppresses the poor shows contempt for God, but whoever is kind to the needy honors him. Now listen to me. You heard me make the statement, we need to give to those generously who are truly in need. What does that mean? Well, God has given us a mind. God has given us discernment. God has given us discretion. But can I tell you something else that God has given to us? An open channel of communication with Him 24-7, 365. Why are you saying that, Pastor Rob? Well, I'm saying that because there's some people out there that when you give to them, they're not truly in need. There are people out there who are milking the system. There are people out there who are taking advantage of people. But you want to know what I believe the Bible says? Ask the Lord. You want wisdom? He says, ask me. You need discernment? Ask me. You're not sure about giving to somebody? You're not sure about helping somebody? Then don't do it until you've prayed about it. And when the Lord gives you peace to give, give. If the Lord gives you peace not to give, then don't give and don't feel bad about it. Because you've sought the Lord. I hate to say the world we live in today, a lot of people take advantage of the word, I'm in need. The Bible says in 2 Thessalonians 3.10, if a man refuses to work, he should not eat. Period. But for a person who is able, a person who is willing to work, a person who also is not living some extravagant lifestyle and expecting somebody else to pay for it, for that type of person who the Lord makes you aware has a need, then I believe we should be obediently, joyfully generous with those type of people. We have a responsibility from the word of God to bless them. Proverbs 19, 17 says, He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward him for what he has done. Over and over again, Scripture talks to us, tells us about being responsible in our giving. Again, let me make sure you hear this. To those who are truly in need. Now I want to brag on this church again. We can't possibly tell you to do that individually if we're not modeling it corporately as a church. And we do. Uh, all of the different ministries, uh, women's ministry, uh, men's ministry, Sunday school ministry, the deacons themselves with the deacon care fund, we help people. Do we do it responsibly? Yes. As responsibly as we can. Do we seek the Lord's will over it? Yes. Do we have teams of people who are administering this? Yes. Why? I'm making sure you understand that we're just not a, a, an open door policy. Here you go. Here you go. Because I'm going to tell you something right now. In the 12 years that I've been a pastor, 12 years or more that I've been a pastor, I've seen a lot of people who are simply out to take advantage of places like Lighthouse Baptist Church. I wish I didn't have to say that, but it's true. But... That shouldn't make us say, well, because that, we're not helping. The, the Bible doesn't say that. The Bible doesn't say, well, hey, if somebody comes and takes advantage of you, if somebody comes and takes advantage of your church, then you should just shut down your giving. No, no, no. Are we responsible? Yes. But do we give? Do we assist? Do we help? Have we been taken advantage of? I'm sure we have. My lead deacon, Jay, sitting back there, he could tell you. 
But does that stop us from giving? No. Does it stop us from being responsible? Does it stop us from seeking out God's will about it? No. And we have helped, tremendously helped, many families, many individuals. And we should be proud of that. Why? Because Jesus Christ himself, where God speaking through Solomon said, He who is kind to the poor, listen, lends to the Lord. And he will reward him for that. We should give to our children. We should give to the truly needy. Number three, we should give to the church. We should give to the church. Now Malachi 3 10 says, bring the tithe into the storehouse. Bring the tithe into the storehouse. Now, the Jewish people were told to bring their tithe, to bring their giving to the temple. And when they brought it to the temple, it was used to help the poor, and it was used to pay the salary of the priest. Now, you remember the tribe of Levi, they didn't get an inheritance. They didn't get an allotment in the land. Their income, their their families being taken care of was from the giving of the people. Now, first and foremost, for the integrity of Scripture, let me say this. The church and the storehouse are not the same in Scripture. But you've got to grab this principle. When you're applying an Old Testament teaching, you've got to look for the underlying general principle that is governing the specific action of a command. And the underlying principle here is that they were giving. The people of Israel were giving to the place where they were being blessed spiritually. They were giving to the temple. They were giving to the place where they were receiving spiritual instruction. They were giving to the place where they were getting together corporately and worshiping the Lord. They were giving to a place where when they got together corporately to worship the Lord and be benefited spiritually, they were getting blessed by getting to fellowship, communicate, live with fellow believers, uh, fellow Christians. Acts chapter 4 says this about the early church. There were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned lands or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet. Giving, yes, that's important there. But who did they give it to? The apostles. Let me tell you what that means. The apostles, they were the founding stone. They were the foundation under Christ. Obviously, he's the foundation. The apostles were responsible for the formation and starting and preaching of and to the church. Period. Whether you like it or not, some of the strongest teachings on giving, some of the strongest teachings on giving in the New Testament are the New Testament letters written by different men, a lot of them by Paul, to the members of actual local churches. The church at Corinth, the church at Ephesus, the church at Galatia, the church at Colossae, the church in Rome. See, these instructions were sent to members of the local bodies of these churches. But here's something you've got to grab a hold of. And this is incredibly important in regards to your giving to the church, the local body. Scripture clearly teaches. Let me say that again. Scripture clearly teaches that the local New Testament church is the only I'm going to repeat that. The local church is the only organization that God himself, through Christ, has called into existence. It is the only organization that is ordained by him and chosen by him to be the vehicle, the primary vehicle of the gospel to the world. Period. Don't believe me? then take however long you need to get a concordance, get a commentary, and search the scriptures. And you want to know what you're going to find? You're not going to find another organization that was ordained by God than the local church. The local church is the only God-ordained organization, hear me, God-ordained organization made up of us that's supposed to carry out the Great Commission. You said, I thought the Great Commission was my responsibility. It is. But you're a part of a local body. Many members, one body. Disciples making disciples who make disciples. We're the only organization called, ordained by God to do this. So what are you trying to say, Pastor? Here's what I'm trying to say. If you want to be obedient, if you want to be generous, if you want to be joyful, if you want to be God-pleasing with your giving, 
then the local church that you are a part of, whether it's this church or another church, the local body of believers that you are a part of will be the primary tool you use for giving. Now, does that mean that there's anything wrong with other organizations? Anything wrong with Latrobe Street? Anything wrong with the gospel mission? Praise God for the gospel mission. Anything wrong with the Women's Care Center? Anything? No. We give to those. Whether it be through manual labor and support, whether it be financially, we give to those as a part of our giving as a church. If you give to them, great. You give to the Salvation Army, great. There's nothing wrong with those organizations as long as you're not saying, that's my primary giving envelope, that's my primary giving uh, avenue for the work of the Lord. You can say that all day, but you're not right. The church is the only organization ordained by God for the Great Commission, period. Now let me tell you something. That puts a lot of responsibility on the church. It's a lot of responsibility on the, uh, the leadership of a church. Because let me tell you something, and we're going to get into this more next week, especially when we get to the how much. Your responsibility to be obedient to God is to give to the church. Once you willingly give that money to the church, you're not going to be held responsible for what the church does with it. Now, that doesn't mean that we shouldn't have business meetings, and we do. And that doesn't mean that you can't have a say or you should look at the papers, ask questions, and find out. But in the end, if the church chooses to use the money that you're giving for something that goes against the Word of God or something that God's not directing us to do, you're not going to answer for that. We are. What I'm trying to get you to understand is this. The church... The only organization ordained by God to carry out his primary mission should be your primary source of giving. Now, I, I got to say this again, and you're like, Pastor, you've repeated yourself several times today. Yes, because I want to make sure you're not going to misquote me or anything like that. There is nothing wrong with giving to other places. We do that as a church, we do that as a family. Give, just don't short. The church to do the other. I say the same thing to you every time we have a special offering. Every time we do the Annie Armstrong or fall or spring or, or Christmas missions offering. I want you to give, sure. But don't short your normal giving to the church because of that offering. That's not obedient. That's not generous. And therefore it's not joyful giving. And that, that is what God wants. We're done for today. I want you to know that my biggest goal in preaching this message is to equip you. Not to shame you, not to guilt you, because like I said last week about evangelism, if I guilt you into giving because of my words, that's not going to last. But here's what I want. I want you to be blessed. I, I want the storehouses and the windows of heaven to open up and God just to dump his blessings on you because that's what he's promised. Now that shouldn't be our motive, but that's what he's promised. I don't want us to be a church where though we're doing great giving wise, though we're doing great as a whole, as a pastor, if there was just one person, which I'm sure there's more, but if there was just one person who wasn't giving to the level that God expects, I don't want you to miss out on the blessing for you and I don't want you to mess up the church. Because you understand if you're not giving to the level that God wants you to give, you are disobeying him. And if you are disobeying him and you're a part of this body, then you're going to have an effect on you and you're going to have an effect on us. And you'll give an answer one day.